All right, as we go into our Sunday School lesson today, this is the fifth week in our studies on the whole armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6. And as it is our practice, we are going to read the passage again, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. I trust it is somewhat familiar to all of us by now. And yet, of course, we, we have to recognize that the power of God comes through his word as it is read and taught. So we always want to read the word. So if you turn in your Bibles there to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, I'm going to read that to us again in just a moment. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in the opening, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. One of the things that we have said throughout this Sunday School series from the very beginning is that Victory in spiritual warfare is not something that we have in and of ourselves. It is something that comes to us only in active reliance upon Jesus Christ. And that active reliance on Christ should lead us to responsible action in Christ and in his strength. As Paul says here, be being strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There's the reliance. But then in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God Verse 13, be taking up the whole armor of God. And so, active reliance, responsible action. Last week, we talked about the readiness given by the gospel of peace. At the end of verse 15, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And I did give you some notes on your handout, but again, I think it's helpful to just see if, how much we remember without looking at the review sheet. When we talk about peace, when Scripture talks about peace, what does it mean? Who remembers? Anna, go ahead. Okay, so it is, in some, it's, yeah, that's, that's certainly a piece of it, right? It's, it's an opposite of warfare. Go to Danielle. Okay, being right with God, okay, that's an important aspect of it, right? Others? So peace has that vertical relationship. There's a, there's a vertical peace, peace with God. Is, that the on, is the vertical axis the only axis on which peace exists for us? Gabrielle, you're shaking your head no. Why not? Okay, there's also peace with each other, right? And so Scripture, when Scripture talks about peace, talks about peace both with God and with others. So vertical and horizontal relationships. And that peace is a, the opposite of a state of warfare. But let me ask it this way. Is peace simply the lack of conflict? Or is there more to it in Scripture? Dan, you're shaking your head. It's not just the lack of conflict. What else is it? It's a flourishing of whatever wants Just because there's lack of fighting doesn't mean there's not a lot of Like, for example, a lack of death does not mean it's not very good. Right. Right. So it's the same thing as lack of fighting, but also a uh, flourishing well-being of one another. Yeah. 
Very good, right. So for those listening online or through the ears, it's not just a lack of conflict, that's a part of it, that's sort of the prerequisite, but in addition to a lack of conflict, there is an active flourishing. There is a, a well-being. And that well-being, that flourishing, uh, is a good thing. And so when we talk about a good thing, we have to ask, good by whose standards? Do you and I have the right to define what peace means for us, what well-being is for us? People are shaking their heads. No, so who defines then what our well-being and what our peace should look like? God does, right. So, so let's put all this together. So when we talk about peace in the scriptures, or that Old Testament word shalom, the uh, New Testament word erene, any of you have the middle name Irene? Comes from that word, Irene. It, it's, it's the idea of a comprehensive state of well being affecting both our vertical and horizontal relationships, um, a flourishing defined by God's standard of righteousness. And so you should see, too, then, that these things are interrelated, all these pieces of armor, right? So the, the peace of God is in part defined by the righteousness of God, which is in part defined by the truth of God. And aren't those the pieces of the armor of God that we've been studying together? So they are interconnected, they're interlocking. Um, something else we said last week that we didn't touch on in our discussion yet is that this peace is a gift that comes to us through Christ. There is it is not possible to have peace according to biblical standards without a relationship with the Lord Jesus. And the devil will, of course, attack the peace of the church and he will attack that peace in a number of ways. What are some of the ways, we don't have to be comprehensive here, but what are some of the ways in which the enemy will attack the peace of the church? Okay, say that a little louder, Dale. So inner strife, do you mean within the body or within our hearts? It could be both, right. Okay, so stirring up division within the body, okay. And then, Dale, you also mentioned stirring up, you know, doubts, malicious thoughts, even in our own hearts. Yeah, very good. And so we need to put on the peace of God. And how do we do that? This is a softball question, guys. Through Christ. Yes, through Christ through prayer, through seeking to live at peace with one another, through really choosing where and when we need to disagree. Um, some things are majors. Some things are gospel issues that need to be stood for and, and their contrary stood against. Other things are not as important. And part of, part of being people of peace is learning the distinction between the majors and the minors and seeking one another's wisdom even in learning those things. So, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Why is it called readiness? Why was it compared to shoes? Because good boots give you firm footing, both to, to go forward and to stand when you need to. And that peace of God, that comprehensive sort of bottom level, foundational state of your heart and state of the church gives us a firmness to stand against the schemes of the enemy. So Paul goes on then in verse 16, and it's interesting here, we're going to dig into this today. He, um, he even is a little more emphatic here at the beginning of verse 16. He says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, he wants us to take up all the armor in all circumstances, but when he gets to the shield of faith, he kind of reiterates it and says, Okay, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. And so we want to start by talking about and just understanding together, what does the Bible mean when it talks about faith? Faith is one of these core ideas in Scripture. And it's also one that, that may not be easily defined. Sometimes uh, we, may, we may just assume that everybody understands what it is, and so we may not actually explain it. I remember growing up in, in an OPC church, and being told all the time, rightly so, from Sunday school on, you know, young Sunday school on, you need to believe in Jesus, you need to believe in Jesus. But I don't remember anybody ever really explaining to me what faith is. They would talk about what faith does, faith prays, faith obeys, all that's true. 
But to actually explain to me what faith is, I don't remember that ever happening. And I remember asking somebody one time, like I was 14, I raised my hand in a youth group lesson and said, you know, you're always telling us to believe in Jesus. Well, what does that mean? And the answer was, well, you know, you say a sinner's prayer. Well, that might be something that faith does. Prayer is something that faith does, but that is not what faith is. And so it's very important for us to understand what faith is, especially if we're going to take this up as our armor. And so the first thing I want to point out to you today is just at the most general level, what is faith? Right there on your handout. Faith is believing God. It is believing God. Believing God will do what he says. Believing God will keep his promises. And the great example of this, the most explicit example of this, comes from Genesis chapter 15, the first six verses. And so we're going to read this to you and unpack it a little bit. This is in the story of Abraham, relatively early in the story of Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he, this is the Lord, brought him, Abram, outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he, Abram, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now it's very interesting, brothers and sisters. Now, prior to this point in the book of Genesis, we have seen, we have seen people acting in faith. We have seen markers of faith. So right at the end of Genesis chapter 4, we are told that in those days men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's an act of faith. And Genesis chapter 6, as the, the story is leading into the story of Noah, we're told that, that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. So we know faith was living and active in believers prior to this moment. Um, at, chapter, at the end of the flood story, you know, Abra, or Noah builds an altar Genesis 12, when God calls Abram and says, come, Abram goes. So faith has been active even prior to this point, and yet what's really interesting is that this passage before us, Genesis 15, this is the first place in the Bible that the Hebrew word aman, to believe, is used. And if you look at the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it's also the first place that the Greek verb for believe, pistuo, is used. So this, is, this passage is... Is sort of, I think your outline says the first account, really the first explicit account of faith in the Bible, kind of laid out for us, unpacked for us. And so very helpful then to use this to help us understand what faith is. And so one thing that we can note right away, just from the verses in front of us, is that, that faith can have a sort of dialogical character. Now, what is a dialogue? Okay, softball. It's a conversation, right? Uh, somebody speaks, somebody responds, right? There is, there, is an, there is an outgoing speaking and then there is a responsive speaking, right? So it is not a, it's not something where one person can be passive. That's not faith. You can't be completely passive. So what does faith look like here? Well, in verse 1, God came to Abram, or Abraham, his name hadn't changed yet. He came to Abram with a promise. What was the first promise he made? Well, right there in verse 1. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. Now, that was a promise that God made. It doesn't tell us that Abram disbelieved. In fact, the book of Romans tells us that he did believe, and chapter verse 6 tells us that. And yet, did Abram have an easy time believing that promise? What does the text tell us? He didn't have an easy time. It doesn't say he disbelieved, but it, it, it makes it clear that it wasn't easy. Why was it not easy? Go ahead, Gabriel, a little up. Because he didn't have his own son. Now again, you know, even to this day, having children is something that families enjoy and desire. But particularly in the ancient Near Eastern world, um, particularly if you were a man of wealth and a man that hoped to accomplish anything long term, what was very important was that you had an heir. You know, an heir who could take up the name, take up the property, take up the program of that family. 
Uh, to be childless in that day was to, to basically be marked for extinction. So Abram struggled, right? And what does he say? He's, 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 he's responding in belief, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? So he's still calling upon the Lord. He's still, he's not saying, he's not disbelieving God, but he's, he's honestly articulating the things that, that make it hard for him to believe. Uh, and he is responding. God promises, Abram responds. How does God respond to Abram's struggles? Okay, right, so he comforts him with what's going to be. He reiterates the promise, and then what does he do? He expands upon it. And he even clothes it in the language of ordinary experiences. So God employs for Abram what I call gospel imagination. He's taking the truth and clothing it with the language and experience of ordinary life. So what does he do? He says, well, listen, this man shall not be your heir. This man you've mentioned, Eleazar of Damascus, member of his household, probably like a high-ranking servant of some sort. He will not be your heir. It's actually going to be your very own son. And then what does he do to help him sort of get a, a mental picture? He takes him outside, and what does he show him? The stars. Do you, think, do, you, do you imagine that probably for the rest of his life, Abram, every night when he went outside and looked at the stars, said, God's promise is that big. He says, number the stars if you are able to number them. How many stars are there in the sky, even on a... Even, on an, even, even in an age with light pollution, that we have at least seven, at least seven. You counted them once, there's at least seven. Okay, at least seven, at least. And that's in an era where, where light pollution is almost impossible to avoid. But think about, this is the ancient Near East. There are no floodlights. There are no warehouses, you know, there are no spotlights. No airports, right? I mean, this is just, and if it was a cloudless night, I mean, imagine the kind of stars that you would see. And, he sa and, and, you know, Abram's taking a look, you imagine, and God says, your offspring will be like that. And so what do we have here? We have God's promise, Abraham struggles, God's expanding and reiterating his promise. And then Abram has a choice. It doesn't tell us, he, you know, he had a choice, but the choice is implicit there. He had a choice. He had to decide whether he would believe God's promise or whether he would believe his own struggles. Which, which would he believe? Would he believe God's promise or would he believe his own doubts? And what did he choose? He chose to believe God's promise. And we are told, Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And so that dialogical nature of faith is something that we can learn from even now. God makes promises to us in the gospel. We may at times struggle to believe them for various reasons. Uh, spiritual struggles, emotional struggles, physical struggles, relational struggles, vocational struggles, all sorts of things can make it hard. And it's okay for us to confess those things to the Lord. But then God comes back and says, but my promise is this. And he expands upon it and clothes it. And what is the ultimate um, Clothing of God's promises, if you were. Clothed in flesh and blood. Right. And so the ultimate reiteration and the ultimate expansion and the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises is in the life, death, and the resurrection and even the continued promises and intercession of Jesus. And so then we have a choice. Will we believe our doubts or will we believe the Lord? And as Christians, the answer is we must believe the Lord. Now, a question we might have is, well, is that, that faith that we see in Abram, is that the same as what faith means in the New Testament? Yet the answer is yes. And the Apostle Paul makes this really clear from Romans chapter 4, the first five verses. That's also in your handout here as well. And this, Romans chapter 4, if you, I know some of you ladies have been in the ladies' Bible study studying through the book of Romans. Uh, Beginning in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, and then going forward through chapter 4 and even further on, Paul shifts from talking about the depravity and, and the lostness of humanity to what major concept in the gospel? Salvation, and particularly how we are right with God, right? But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, justified through faith. And so it's in the context of Paul's great discussion of justification and faith 
And, and as Paul is looking for an example from the Scriptures and from the history of God's people to illustrate what faith is, he reaches back to whom? To Abraham. And so he says this in Romans chapter 4, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? And then he's quoting Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness or for righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And then he goes on to quote from the Psalms. Um, but his first example that he reaches back to is the example of Abram and the example of Genesis 15. And so faith is, at its most basic level, it is believing God. Now, it's very important at this point to make a distinction, which I think you all would understand, but it's helpful to make this clear. Believing God doesn't just mean believing facts about God. Is it possible for a person to believe facts about God and not actually believe God? Yeah, that's exactly right. I was just going to ask, what, what level of, what, what, what part of the enemy force knows things about God? Satan knows things about God. The demons know things about God. In terms of, you know, academic, factual theology, they could probably score higher than many of us. And yet they are, they are damned. They are cursed. Because faith is not just believing facts about God. It is believing God himself. Very important distinction. When God, you know, again, God's promises are extended. A promise is always an extension of the person who makes it. You realize that? You know, yesterday we, we had an opportunity, uh, you know, some of us to, to witness the wedding here. And when the bride and the groom make promises to one another, they are making, it is an extension of their own selves. And when you believe a promise, you are taking hold not just of the words, but of the person who spoke the words. It's the same with God. God's promises are an extension of God himself. They are God's personal commitment to do what God has promised. And so when we believe God's promise, we are taking hold of God himself. You see this in the Gospel of John. It says, he came to his own, speaking of Jesus, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, comma, who believed in his name, comma, he gave the right to become sons of God. And so John is putting in parallel there, receiving Christ with doing what? Believing on his name, believing his promises. So the promises of God are like God's open hand. When you believe those promises, it's like taking his hand. So faith is not just believing facts about God. It is believing God himself and resting then our destiny in his hands. Now, what differences existed between believers in the Old Testament and believers in the New Testament in terms of faith? Did you have a question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, a very good question. Let's see if, the, if um, rather than just me answering, so we, we, we have a choice to believe in God, but where is the sovereignty of God in that? Who knows the answer? Go ahead, Dominic. Right, exactly. So the Catechism says, how does the Spirit apply to us? How does the Holy Spirit apply to us the redemption that Jesus purchased? He says he does it by working faith in us, uniting us to Christ in what's called effectual calling. Well, what is effectual calling? It's the work of God's Spirit, renewing our minds, renewing our hearts, persuading and enabling us. So yes, we, 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 we choose to believe, but it is because God has opened our hearts to believe and has persuaded our hearts to believe. Trina, go ahead. Mm-hmm. 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It is a gift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, faith is a gift. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Sure. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, let, Dan, I'll come to you in just a second. Just for those who are listening online, one of the things that Trina was just pointing out to us is that, is that faith is a gift and that it is a gift of God. This was uh, bouncing off the previous question. It is a, a, so a gift of God's sovereignty, a, a sovereign gift of God, and it creates in us, by the power of the Spirit, that capacity and desire to believe the promises of God. And then it can be weak and it can be strong and it can grow and it, it, it needs to be nourished, of course, as well. Is that a fair summary of what you were saying? Okay, Dan, what, what did you want to add? Many things flow out of faith. It's, yes, yes, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, good. So we are, we're, we're grasping at this concept, and it is an interesting word, the interesting idea, because there are, there's a whole, uh, you know, a word group. There's the verb, the noun, the adjective. Um, yes, this is God's sovereign gift to rely on him. Doug, go ahead. To clarify, That's a great question. Yes. Right. So again, for those online, Doug is Doug is reminding us that you know God brings us to faith, and that is a, a sovereign imposition, a gracious and a good one. Yet, nevertheless, it is monergistic. It is one-sided. God reaches down and says, "I'm going to change your heart," and we believe, and then we do have a responsibility to grow. Yet, even in that responsibility, do we ever move beyond believing the promises of God, relying on the Word of God? I would say no, it's just a further development of those things. Um, go ahead, Aaron. I do. Us, but we need to see that knowledge is true. In the absence 
not have been able to get them in the way, and then we continue to believe in it, and then our faith in the in that statement, their uh -huh. cell phone and pass the property is also being added to the person. So right. we were to exchange passwords with God, the cell phone was the truth of the gospel, and all the other contingencies mm. along with believing, that's kind of what you can see with Jim. He would not have been able to come across the truth, their cell phone and the property of God, and sovereignly revealing the mm. truth. Yeah. Just how God does that to us, we can't apprehend that truth because, like you said, it's not just the truth. Right. So, again, I'll try to summarize that uh, uh, for those online. I think Aaron's, Aaron's core point was that using an analogy of like a cell phone in a pocket, the initial, the initial saving revelation is a revelation of God, something that we would not acquire elsewise. And then our responsibility is to continue believing it even when we are physically absent from the Lord. Fair summary of what you're saying? So that's the idea of faith, and it has these multifaceted, there's multi, multiple angles and splendor to faith. Um, I do want to make sure we have time to talk about the, sh the idea of shield. So I'm going to move the rest of page one pretty quickly. The, the big difference between Old Testament and New Testament faith is not in essence, but in distance. Right? The book of Hebrews says that the Old Testament believers died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen and greeted them from afar. But in the New Testament, God's promises are all yes and amen in Jesus. And so they come near. Let's, let's flip over to the back. One of the things that is so interesting in thinking about this language that Paul uses of the shield of faith is that when we look at that passage in Genesis 15 and God comes to Abram and makes a promise, what is the first thing God promises to be to Abram? He says, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. And you know what's cool is that's the first time that word shield is used in that sense in the Old Testament. But then it's not the last time. It's, it seems to me like many times in the Psalms, when, when the psalmist uses the word shield to refer to God, it's probably reflecting and picking up on that original story, that origin story. God promised to be a shield, and so the Psalms say, you are a shield about me, over and over again. And I give you a footnote where you can, you can see all the places that it's used in the Psalms. And a couple other places, Deuteronomy, 2 Samuel, even in Proverbs. God promises to be a shield to his people. And um, not, only, not only are there direct references to God promising to be the shield of his people, but then also in the scriptures and in the Old Testaments, that idea of our shield is applied not just to God himself, but to Israel's king. And so how do those things come together in the New Testament, the idea of God himself and the king of God's people? Again, softball. Dan, you ready for this? What's your Sunday school answer? Jesus. Right. So Jesus, the king of God's people, the ultimate king of God's people, and God himself is the shield of his people. So when we talk about the shield of faith, we're talking about, in part, we're remembering that Jesus is our shield. And yet, Paul speaks of the shield of faith. And so it's right for us to ask, well, what role did faith play in the life of Jesus? Did Jesus have to exercise faith? faith. He did. It's a little bit different from the faith we exercise, but nevertheless, he did believe God's promises. And we see this in a couple places, both from the book of Hebrews, one we're going to look at this morning in our sermon. Hebrews 5, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. Prayers and supplications flow out of what? They flow out of faith. With loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience to what he suffered. And then Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Some older translations say the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So that passage there in Hebrews 12 tells us that Jesus, looking through his sufferings, looking through the cross to the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Now, what does it mean to say that Jesus had faith? And what distinctions do we need to make? I'm giving you a quote there next 
on the outline from Gerhardus Voss. I think this is very helpful. He says, Faith, through which a guilty sinner becomes just in the sight of God, our Lord could not exercise because he was sinless. But the faith that is an assurance of things hoped for and a proving of things not seen at a large place in his existence. So to put this another way, the two sub-bullets, Christians, you and I, we believe God for redemption. We believe that we will be raised to life instead of dying for our sins. Christ believed God not for redemption, but for vindication, that he would be raised to life after dying for our sins. Jesus believed that God would raise him from the dead. Those promises that were in the Psalms, those promises of the Old Testament, you will not abandon my soul to shale, nor let your Holy One see corruption. He believed that. He didn't need to believe God for forgiveness of sins because he didn't have any sin. But he believed that God would vindicate him after he died for our sins. You see the, see the distinction? It's very helpful because it reminds us that Jesus was perfect for us, not just in his thoughts and words and his deeds, but also he was perfect for us in his faith. And just like everything that Jesus does can cover the things that we fail to do, so when our faith is weak, whose faith will cover the flaws and the holes in our faith? Christ's. Just like his actions cover all the failures of you and I to obey. Just like his perfect words cover our, the, our failures to speak perfectly, our, our sins. Now, how will the enemy try to destroy our faith? What are the flaming darts of the evil one? Yeah, well, I'm going to read a quote and then we're going to unpack this together. This is from John Stott. He says, The devil's darts no doubt include his mischievous accusations which inflame our conscience with false guilt. Other darts are unsought thoughts of doubt and disobedience, rebellion, lust, malice, or fear. So what are the ways, question for us to discuss, what are the ways in which the enemy attacks our faith? Dominic, you had something to say right off. Accusing us, what does that mean? All right, so accusing us, reminding us of all the ways in which we fail to match up and to measure up to the perfect standard of God. Okay, what else? Are there other ways? What was the first way in which Satan attacked faith in the Bible? All the way back in the Garden of Eden. Go ahead, uh, David. Temptation, yeah, and you remember, David, what, what he said to Eve, the very first question. Right. Did God really say that? That's a very insidious attack. What, 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 is, what is Satan trying to do there? Did God actually say? Right. Cast doubt. Right. Throw doubt, cast shade on the Word of God. Well, yeah, he goes, on to, he goes on to call God a liar, right. But the first thing he does is he tries to just cast doubt on the word. Is that really what the Bible means? Is that really what God said? Do we still see that today? What are some ways in which we see that? Dan. Okay, right. So, right. Did God really say that marriage is only to be between one man and one woman? That's, that's one way. Very obvious, very forefronting in our culture. What other, other ways? Right. Do you, real, people, do you really believe that Jesus turned, turned five loaves into enough to feed 5,000 people? Really? That kind of thing, right? That, that kind of, that, yeah, really? The adverbs, right? What else? Right. Maybe he was just a good moral teacher. Are you really believe that Jesus was? Do you really believe that, number one, there is a God, and that if there is a God, he actually became a human being? Right? Trying to cast doubts. Yeah, do I really have to gather for worship rather than, rather than just kind of sleep in and chillax? Right? Right, if God is really good, why do bad things happen? Right, all these ways of casting doubt. Go ahead, Bob. A guy from Nazareth, right, yeah, yeah. Those kind of things, right? Casting doubt on the word of God. 
Does God want me to be obedient or does God want me to be happy? Gavin, what were you going to say? Yeah, well, there's a way of inquiring and then there's a way of, of insinuating, right? So Gavin was saying some people might be asking these questions honestly. That's true. There's also a way of asking the same questions, putting something in the form of a question that really is an insinuation. You know, when Satan said, did God actually say you shall not eat from the fruit of the tree in the garden? What was wrong with that question? It's been a while since we've talked about this. Go ahead, Michael. Well, certainly that's where he's going, but even on the very surface, from the, go ahead, Trina. Exactly. And why is it a deceitful question? It's not an honest question. Why not? Almost. Anna. Yes. How did Satan know what God had said? Did God actually say, you shall not eat from any of the fruit trees in the garden? He had heard him. And then he comes back and said, did God really say that? He already knew the answer. It was a dishonest question. And so the question itself was not a question. It was an insinuation. And I think that may be, Gavin, that's the, the distinction that, that you're trying to make. But there are times when somebody really honestly doesn't know. Somebody might really be struggling philosophically with the, the problem of evil and say, well, you know, how can a good God allow evil? How does that even work? And then there's other people who don't want the answer. Go ahead, do you want to follow up? It could be some combination of both, right. Right, that's exactly right. Go ahead, Betty. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Right. So these are aimed at the believers, um, the enemy trying to attack things that we already know to be true, things that we should already be believing, things that are clear promises of God. Uh, and just, I mean, there's, there's many ways that these things can come about, but I think the point I want to underline for you is, at bottom, every temptation is ultimately an attempt to undermine your confidence in the promises of God, the revelation of God, the Word of God. And so you need to remember that every spiritual attack is ultimately an attack on faith, an attack on the Word of God and on His promises. And that's why I think Paul kind of reiterates here in verse 16, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith. Is, is kind of active faith, uh, actively relying on the Lord, remembering His promises, as Doug was saying earlier, meditating on them, growing in them as Trina was pointing out, stirring up that gift that God has given us? Is that something that you can just say, well, you know, I'll do that on Monday. Sunday morning at Covenant, that's, where I'll, that's my faith time. Monday through Saturday, I'll just kind of wing it. Is that going to work? It's not going to work very well. You're going to fall into all sorts of snares. And so what does it mean then to take up the armor of God? Uh, a couple points here before we end. To take up the shield of faith here means that we need to shelter behind the promises of God. And the word that, that's used here for shield is a, is a, is a really interesting word. Now, norm, some, you know, we think about shields, um, depending on what movies you've seen or what video games you may have played, a shield could look very different, right? It might be this, it looks like a pie plate. It's not the kind of shield that, that Paul is describing here. How, I mean, certainly in the last couple of years, we've seen pictures of police or military or paramilitary in riot gear, right? With the big shields that stand on the ground. That's the kind of shield that Paul is referring to here. It was about four feet tall by about two and a half feet wide. Uh, very strong, you know, as strong as the Romans could make these things on a mass scale. Very heavy shields. And the idea was you would use these in battle. You would shelter behind them. You, they, were, they were large enough that a person could crouch and be almost completely protected. Now that's the idea. And one of the reasons that they used them, one of the reasons that the Roman legions would carry these shields is because the people that were attacking them would, would soak arrows in pitch, and then they would light them on fire. So this is, a, this is an image from, you know, first century warfare. Maybe you've seen the movie Gladiator, not necessarily recommending it, but you, you know, that opening sequence where there is that battle that involved this sort of conflict, flaming arrows, large shields. That 
that idea. We need to shelter, not behind our performance, but behind the promises of God. And then like Abraham, Abram, Abraham, if there are things that, that, that make it hard for you, things that you're struggling to believe, what should you do with those? You should confess them, process them, process them in faith. Be honest with the Lord. I mean, he already knows, doesn't he? If you're struggling to believe something, doesn't God already know you're struggling to believe it? Go ahead, Dan, what were you going to say? Right, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Um, and when our faith is weak, whenever we're just discouraged by the weakness of our faith, we should remember that Jesus' faith, that perfect faith, covers all the holes in our faith. That's not an excuse to not feed on the promises. That's not an excuse to, to sort of say, well, then I don't have to grow. It's never how it works. When God changes you, when Jesus saves you, he says, follow me. And so we are to always be every day, every week, seeking to go further up and further in to his goodness and his promises. But when you are discouraged and when the enemy attacks you, especially with regard to the weakness of your faith, you remember that the perfect faith of Christ covers the imperfect faith in your heart. And then just reflecting on that, again, this is part of how we grow stronger. If even the holes in your faith are paid for by the holes in the hands of Jesus, is there anything that can ultimately stand against you? No. Nothing. What will separate us from the love of God in Christ? Nothing. We are almost out of time. Any, any final thoughts or reflections? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just know this from long years of experience. If you are looking at, on any given day, if you were looking at the quality of your believing for your, for your security as a Christian, you are going to be discouraged, despondent, insecure, and that insecurity will trickle over into everything else. Um, you won't have joy. You won't have, um, you won't have motivation. All, you'll, go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, you'll just, you'll just feel like I'm a failure and I might as well not go forward. But if you look to the promises of God and you trust in the grace of God and you trust in the work of Jesus and even the perfect faith of Jesus to cover all the holes in yours, you will realize that, that I can go forward, not in my power, but in his. Go ahead, Trina. Overcome the world, our, our faith. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we want to be those who win the victory. Not in our own strength, that's a lie, but in the power of Christ. We want to be men and women, young and old, faith. We want to be people who revel and relish this gift that you have given us, this openness, this desire, this capacity, and even a delight to believe your promises. Thank you so much for giving us that gift. Lord, we confess that it was not something we earned. It truly was a unilateral, monergistic act of goodness on your part. Lord, help us to remember that always so that we will be humble. And help us to rely on you always so that we will be confident and in relying on your goodness and your grace, help us to seek to share this shield with others. We live in a world, Lord, that is beset by the, this and besieged by the evil one. And there are so many who are under his thraldom and in his chains. We pray that you would please enable our witness to share with them the grace of the Lord Jesus. And we know that faith comes through hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. So help us to be those who bear the word of Christ in a dark world. And when the enemy attacks us for this, as he will, help us to shelter behind your promises. For you, O oh Lord, are a shield about us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Very good discussion this morning.